Our New Testament reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. And if you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find it on page 129 of the New Testament portion. Before I begin, I'm going to give you a little backstory because it helps um, in understanding our scripture lesson today. Because as Luke tells the story of Peter and Cornelius, it becomes evident that Peter requires a little bit of pressure so that he can speak the words that he does today in our reading. First, Cornelius, a Gentile, a Roman, has received a vision from God. Then God gives Peter his own vision. Then Cornelius sends emissaries to Peter to ask him to come to his house and to visit him. But that's not good enough. God has to tell Peter to get up and go down with these emissaries without hesitation and go to Cornelius' house. Once he's at Cornelius' home, Cornelius recounts his vision again for Peter. And that's where our reading picks up. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to, reappear, and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Now, you may think it's a bit of a stretch, but this Sunday is my favorite Sunday of the entire liturgical year. What, you might ask? Not Easter, not Christmas. Today, I freely admit that the baptism of our Lord's Sunday is hands down my favorite Sunday of the entire year. Now, there are some logistical reasons why it is my favorite. See, it's not one of those Sundays when the church is overly packed and a pastor puts undue pressure upon themselves to say something that everyone can hear. It's also not a Sunday when the church has a bunch of extra decorations around. And I want you to hear me on this and not get me wrong because... I love it when the church is decorated for Christmas and Easter and how it looks with poinsettias or advent wreaths and banners and Easter lilies. But these things can also give a pastor great angst as we have to try and figure out how to navigate a chancel that is a bit different, how we have to stretch and reach all the way across the communion table to get the cup of salvation without knocking over potted plants and causing a domino effect of soil and leaves. Because if anyone could do it, it would be me. And I don't have to worry about standing by the advent wreath and being on guard just in case a lighted wick happens to fall on the dried leaves and flowers so that I can quickly blow it out. I don't have to worry 
about holding back a sneeze tickled up by pollen. And I don't have to worry about accidentally tripping over something that I'm not used to being on the chancel. There is a reason my middle name is not Grace. Remember, I'm the one who can fall out of a pew while just sitting there. <laughs> there are, is also uh, some more personal reasons why today is my favorite. It is the tradition of this congregation to ordain and install elders and deacons on baptism of our Lord Sunday. And I love that. I mean, the symbolism of men and women stretching themselves and making their vows to serve in the church on a day when we recognize Jesus' baptism is beautiful to me. It kind of symbolizes their embodiment of what it really means to be a part of the body of Christ as they accept responsibility not only for themselves and their own actions, but for the actions of this church, as they seek to discern together how we live as the body in the world. There's also the fact that this day is rich in sacraments. We remember our baptisms, and then the elders and deacons serve communion immediately after they're installed. And pastors love sacraments. At least this pastor does. This year at the elder and deacon retreat, we took a few moments to talk about what it feels like the very first time you get to serve communion. And it's special. I mean, it was really special to me, and it's really special to many of the men and women who will be serving you a little later in the service. It's not just putting bread and wine or juice in someone's hand. It's not finding the right X to stand on here in the chancel. It's also about getting to look people directly in the eye and saying, God is sharing with you. God is sharing God's very self with you right here, right now, in this place. And in many ways, communion is, is ordinary. I mean, it's just ordinary bread that's shared. It's wine and juice that's poured out. But communion, no matter how we choose to slice it, it is often the antidote for the things that keep us apart. See, serving it, it does not allow us to keep people at an arm's length. It necessarily invites everyone into the body. Our more comfortable responses with each other, like, sorry, that's not really my problem, or I'd rather not deal with you right now, it's not a good time, or it's okay if you keep that to yourself because it's probably none of my business anyway. All of those are quieted, and they're put to the side as those serving communion have to reiterate over and over again. This is the bread of life. This is the cup of salvation. And it's for you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. See, servers are reminded in a very real way that life is truly offered only when it's shared, only when it's given away. I also love the baptism of our Lord Sunday for reasons for which I should probably be ashamed. See, it messes things up. The baptism of our Lord Sunday, it always occurs on the second Sunday in January, which is not the first Sunday of the month. And if 
you're not a regular attender or um, you only attend first service, then you may not know then that at the 11 o'clock service, we only serve communion on the first Sunday of the month, except for when we don't. <laughs> and one of the times we don't is baptism of our Lord Sunday. So that means I get to look out at all of these puzzled faces at the beginning of the service who are trying to figure out why the heck we're having communion when it's not the first Sunday. And there's nothing that I like better than watching a bunch of Presbyterians have to change. <laughs> I told you I should be ashamed. The baptism of our Lord stretches us. We're like Peter who suddenly figures it out that God isn't just converting Cornelius here. God is also converting Peter. And in a way, it's much harder to convert the already converted than it is to convert those who are coming to life for the very first time. Even Peter, while he thinks that he already knows everything that the Lord requires of him, that he's already made all of these mistakes and he's learned from them and he knows exactly what to do now, while he thinks that he's already had all of the regrets that he's going to have and from now on out it's going to be smooth sailing for him, all of a sudden mid-sermon he realizes God is still stretching him. Jesus' death and resurrection didn't put all that to rest for Peter. This is just the beginning for him. He has a lot more stretching to do. In our translation, Peter says, I truly understand God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, that translation is not wrong. Technically, it is correct. But in it, we lose some of the verb tenses and the context. And so everything that Peter says ends up sounding cerebral and academic, which is usually fine for Presbyterians. But when we take all of that into account, the language, the parts of speech, the context, then they tell us that there is more than just a moment of realization for Peter. This is a coming to Jesus moment for Peter. No less than when the cock crows for the third time, Peter is waking up in this passage. This is a moment where he is being converted, and we hear him mid-conversion. We catch him. And here he says a more accurate translation would be, I am grasping, or I am catching on to what God is doing, what Jesus was showing us all along, that God shows no partiality. This is no less than an awakening. Peter went to Cornelius' house expecting something to change, namely expecting Cornelius to change. He was not expecting that he would be changed. And isn't that always the way it is? I mean, here, Peter is being stretched yet again. And he remembers how it was like the message that spread beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And in that moment, the sky opened and a voice from heaven was heard, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. See, for Peter, in the book of Acts, this moment 
that he stands before Cornelius and his household, it's not just any ordinary moment. He's not just preaching another sermon, just saying more words. It's a moment where he catches himself looking past what's immediately in front of him, past the man, past Cornelius, the Gentile, the Roman, and he begins to catch on, begins to grasp that God is still stretching him, still asking him to see more than what's immediately apparent, still wanting him to be a very part of the life he so adamantly proclaims. And that is a bit of a stretch, for it requires Peter to see everything and everyone differently than he has before, just like it always had since the very first day when he met Jesus, since God declared with a voice from heaven saying, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Today is the celebration of the baptism of our Lord. And I'm convinced that we need to remember this day now just as much as Peter needed to remember it then. Because there are a lot of things that are right in front of us. And despite what we think, we don't see them all clearly. To embrace Jesus' baptism, to make his story part of our story, to live the kind of life that baptism sets us free to live, one in which we indeed act and know and realize and grasp that God indeed shows no partiality, is no doubt something that continues to stretch us even today. Amen.